Um, so uh, welcome everyone and uh, to uh, our February talk. Um, so this month, uh, Richard has kindly uh, volunteered to talk about the synthesizer he's been building. Um, I'm, I'm fairly terrible introduction, so it's pretty better I let Richard introduce himself. So I will shut up and hand over to Richard. Thank you, Dave. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to start off by giving you a bit of reasons why I designed this project, a bit of history of synthesizers and how it all started for me, my design, a little bit about synth basics so you can understand how it all works and relates to the computer, and then going into the actual Z80 bit itself. So first of all, why I chose synthesizers, you get to work with everything, digital electronics, analog, and of course they need a CPU to control everything, be it a modern microcontroller if you're building one today, or if you want to build it like it used to be, a Z80 or 6502 or various other 8-bit CPU. So, and then why I chose a Z80, it's very popular, it's still quite popular today, there's still a lot of help on the internet, more so I think than other CPUs of that era, I think the Z80 still has a lot more support out there. You have to do everything, think about your memory locations, your variables, stack pointer, your RAM, absolutely everything you have to do yourself, all your peripherals, the Z80 is just a CPU, with a modern day chip, everything's all integrated. It's essentially the same theory. You've got data buses and address buses and all your peripherals with registers, but it's all inside one chip. So it gives me a greater sense of achievement when I've done something with a Z80 than it does with a PIC or an Arduino. And into that, it teaches you more about programming, understanding binary, understanding hex, having to give a variable a memory address rather than just type it in C and let C, the compiler, do it for you. It just teaches you more about that. So the history then, in the early 70s, synthesizers existed. But Dave Smith from Sequential Circuits in the US designed this machine, the Profit 5. And this was the first ever programmable synthesizer and the first ever to use a microprocessor. It was released in 1978 with revisions all the way to 84. All Z80 controlled, and if you find one today, the average around five grand to buy. They have just re-released a modern version that looks identical to this using the same analog hardware. They've not gone for DSP, they've gone for analog hardware because analog is coming back. Because in the 80s, digital came about, everybody didn't like analog anymore, so they chucked out all these old machines, and that's why they're so expensive today because they sought after, because people like that original analog. Same with the computers. So a few synths that used it, I'm not gonna to go too much into this, because if you're not really into synths, it might not mean anything, but these are just a list of the classic 80s machines that used the Z80 CPU. And the Roland Jupiter is my favorite, this is an absolute beast. And if you find one today, again, they're about 12 grand to buy. Even a broken one will set you back about eight, nine grand. So as the 80s moved on, the, fir the few, first few years of the 80s, again, same with the home computer market, was just a big revolution of synths, computers, the development of CPUs, and they also developed MIDI, which is Musical Instrument Digital Interface, and it was the first ever communication between two synthesizers and sequences. It was developed by Sequential, Dave Smith in the US and Roland in Japan. It runs at 31250 board, which I believe is because it's easy to divide from say eight megahertz or 16 megahertz, it just divides straight down. And it used the Motorola 6850, which was a Profit 600, the first synth to use MIDI. And that's the UART that I use in my, the Motorola 6850. So it allowed sequences and computers to control instruments and play sounds. So that's um, Vince Clark on the left. I don't know who that is on the right. Depeche Mode Man, there's BBC there, obviously controlling those synths via MIDI so you could sequence all the songs. So if you like Depeche Mode or any of the early 80s bands, chances are you're hearing a synth that is being powered by a Z80 CPU, especially the early stuff. My design, my design is based on this machine, the Roland Juno 106. I own one of these, they're not exactly rare, there's loads still about. 
and they're about 1500 to buy and that's why i paid for mine fully serviced from sound gas which is a uk based company that still sell vintage hardware it doesn't use a z80 cpu it uses some nec I've written it out yet, 7811G NEC microcontrollers when microcontrollers, this was 1984, so microcontrollers were a little bit more popular then. But it uses the 8253 stroke four interval timers, which I use with the Z80. So I've kind of mixed it up a bit. I'm using the Z80, but I've based my analog circuitry on this synth, which didn't use the Z80. So I've used a bit of artistic license with that one. This is my machine. As you can see, I've copied the similarities the similarities between the two, apart from the sliders, because I had to drill it myself, so I couldn't do sliders, I just used pots. And this is the internals. So if the CPU board over to the right, power supply CPU board, and then the analog hardware over here to the left. So my design has got Z80 controls the synth, and all sound generation is done with analog hardware. We need to know what key's been pressed, what note to play, read the front panel, store those values, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. So the synth, uh, it needs an oscillator that's pitch controlled. So this can be either by a variable voltage in the early days, which is usually one volt per octave. An octave is 12 notes on a keyboard. So from white keys to the black keys, 12 notes. And it's good because each octave as you go up doubles in frequency, so it's quite easy to work out. So it can be used as voltage controls, which has tune instability problems, never worked well in the early days. So then that's why Roland decided to use digitally controlled and they use the interval timers. Crystal oscillator, that frequency can be pretty much bang on. Five octaves on, on my keyboard. So from the bottom to the top, you just multiply it by two each time you go up. So as you press a key higher up the keyboard, it just doubles the frequency. Basic synth voice, you have your keyboard, your oscillator, and then your analog hardware here. I won't go into the analog hardware, we'll concentrate more on the computer and the digital, but I think this will give you a good idea of why we need to do the digital bits to how it relates into the analog bits. The gate is when you press a key. So we press the key, it triggers the gate, tells that synth that's been controlled. I have five voices. A voice is just a sound generation module. So when you press a key, it plays a note. If you press another key, you need another identical set of hardware to play that second note. So the computer needs to scan the keybed, know which note's been pressed and know which note's been released, change the pitch of the oscillator and trigger the analog hardware to function. So polyphonic, which I just mentioned, plays more than one key at a time, which is called a voice. I've built six voices so I can press six keys at once. If I press the seventh key, it will just ignore it and play nothing. If I release a key, press another key, as long as I'm still within that six, the computer will scan the keyboard and it will play the next note. So a voice needs a common analog parameters to set your sound characteristics. So your filter levels, your volumes, those kind of things. And then digital parameters to switch off your waveforms because you might have sawtooth, square waves, sub-octave, which is a square wave divided down by two, so it's an octave below the rest of the note. And then you could have a second oscillator. There's many, many things you can have. So you need the CPU to be able to turn these on and off. And then it needs an individual gate, so when you press your key, it triggers the sound and the pitch frequency of the note to play, which in my case triggers the timers. I'll talk more about this in a little bit when I go on to the actual computer section. So the development of this for me is written in Z80 Assembler. I've used an 8K ROM, but I only use about three kilobytes of it. I just use the Atmel ROMs that you can buy quite easily these days, modern. I still think they make them, the Atmel are 8K parallel ROMs. I use this Z80 IDE, which is cut from Orson Soft, which is a European company, it's about 30 euros to buy. And then I manually program the ROM with the desktop programmer. Anybody doing Z80, if you've not heard of this, get it, because this software is amazing. It's by this Orson Soft. This is a little bit of code that I've put in, but it simulates everything. So when I'm developing, 
for the Z80 and I want to know what's going on. I can see my memory, I can see the IO ports, I can see the registers, and it will also highlight the code as it's running through it to tell me where it is on the code and what's happening with the registers. So I can simulate what's going on. It gets quite annoying if you have inputs because it pops up asking you to put the input in all the time. But if you want to do something and work out like a memory copy or something like that, you can see what's going on. Because sometimes value, data values might, if you've got a number wrong on your counter or your loop, your number might be going somewhere else and it's going to be hard to find on your actual unit. So using the simulator, I can test it all out and see how it's working before I actually port that across to the actual hardware itself. So it's absolutely brilliant. It's a really, really good piece of software. I couldn't do it without this. This was just absolutely amazing. It's Windows only. So I am a Mac user mostly, but I have a PC in my workshop. So I use this software down there. We've probably seen this one before. This is just the uh, good old Chinese programmer. Works quite well. Pop my ROM in, load up the hex file that this software creates. It will assemble to a hex file for me. And then I pop that in there and then load up my ROM. Into the Z80 computer section then. So this is my machine. It's got a four megahertz clock. Four megahertz does everything I need. I could probably do it a bit slower, to be honest. Four megahertz seems to run quite nicely. This feeds the timers, and then it's also divided down for the UART. So I divide this into three frequencies. There's four megahertz, two megahertz, one megahertz. So that feeds the timer, and then it also goes into the UART at one megahertz, and then the UART's got its own divider inside, which can divide by 16 or 32 or 64. So you can divide it down by those blocks to get your actual frequency that you want. It's got 8K ROM, and I've said, like I say, it's used about 3K. 2K of RAM for system variables a stack, and I've only used about 300 bytes. I can't get any RAM chips smaller than two kilobytes, so that's just what I've used. Then I also have a separate two kilobytes of RAM, which is battery backed up to store the patches. A patch is just your analog and digital settings of your synthesizer. So when you've set your front panel, potentiometers, analog parameters, digital parameters, you save that. It saves it into a block of memory, which I've used 16 bytes just for ease. I haven't used all 16 bytes, so I just allocated a block so I can just multiply easily as I go along. And how it used to be done in the very, very early days, that chip was just backed up by a battery. They soon got rid of that because it was unreliable, but that's how I've done it because I've gone back into the very early days of the first Z80-based synth. The UART is interrupt on IM1, which jumps to 38 hex for my interrupt service routine. I've got two 8254 timers, the brilliant chips, the 8254 timers. They give me three channels each. So for my six voices, I've been using two chips, three voices, and then three voices on the other. 6850 UART. I'm using ADC0808s, which I'm going to talk about later on in this presentation. And I'm using the 8279 keyboard and display. 8279 and 8254 are absolutely amazing chips. Even today, to use in a modern system, I think they're just brilliant chips. Going to a basic block diagram, fairly straightforward, standard Z80 computer, CPU, ROM, RAM, the UART. The, I've got two 8279s. I've got one to read the actual keyboard that you play, and then the keyboard for the front panel buttons. Two timers, and then a latch that controls my gates. I haven't drawn in everything on the memory decoder. I'm using the IO decoder on address lines A4 to A7. So I've got, sorry, A3 to A7. So I've got zero, one, and two reserved for external IO. So I've got eight addresses on each block, on each output. And the memory decoder just goes 8K RAM, 2K RAM, and 2K RAM. And what I've used is I've used an AND gate for the 8K RAM. I use the 138 decoder, but because I like having everything in line, I don't like leaving a big gap. I could have divided them all up to 2K, or 8K, but I don't like leaving a big gap. I like everything in line on my code, just the way I am. So I put AND gates on it, so it flows from zero to whatever the end of 12K is. So it just carries on. A Couple of photos to look at with the actual board. 
I'm going to zoom in on some parts of this. This is the CPU board. PCB is double sided. That wasn't really available in the 80s. It was all hand drawn, but I've, I've ignored that bit and done double sided PCB just to make things a bit easier. Z80 CPU here on the left, crystal oscillator there on the left, top, top left crystal oscillator, divided down on the 4013 flip flop, and then buffered just to go around to various different points of the system. 555 timer under the Z80 there does the power on reset. I've later realized that you can just do it simply with a diode, a resistor and a capacitor kind of delay. But I use the 555, which I pinched the circuit off the BBC micro. ROM there to the right of the Z80 and then a couple of RAM chips that we, um, somebody on Instagram pointed out that that was West Germany. And of course, West Germany doesn't exist anymore. So that shows how old those chips are. There's no date stamp on that one, but I think they're probably very early 80s. Decoding logic down at the bottom, fairly standard for your Z80 system, your 138 decoders. And then I've used a few underneath the wires there. I think that's just a not a NAND gate just to do some various address decoding. Down the bottom row, the left hand side, those are H chips. I'm not sure what manufacturer they are actually. They're the timers. Various companies made clones of the Intel 8254. There's an NEC version and of course the Intel version itself. That's those two chips there. And then the Molex connectors with the green and yellow go out to the synth voices. There's a 154 decoder there to give me 16 IO lines. You can see the 6850 there with the opto isolator below it so I can have the MIDI in and out. There is an onboard analog to digital layer which I never used because I wired it up wrong. And I'll explain why I wired it up wrong when I talk about that chip in a little bit. And then supporting logic. And then the one, the two seven threes are the latches. So there's two eight bit latches, one for the gates when you press and release the key, and then one for the digital controls. This is the eight, two, seven, nine. This is reading the keyboard. So those thick wires on the Molexes are the keyboard. The key bed I'm using was from a Roland synth from the 80s, so it's straight out of the 80s, that key bed. No velocity, velocity is how hard you hit the key. There's no velocity, it's just simple on and off. It uses a 138 decoder to just give eight scan lines and then eight return lines. That's being read by the CPU. And then that is pulled, it's not interrupted. But I'll talk about that and that loop in a little bit when we go further on. So there's two main sections. We have the front panel controls and analog pots, and then the keyboards, keyboard, keybed, scanning, and voice allocation. So on the front panel, we have an ADC0828 analog to digital, the Intel 8279 for the LED display and the buttons, and then I have an LCD display, which I just stuck in there just for the sake of it. So I could, I did it primarily so I could write values of the analog so when I was debugging and I was turning a pot, I, I knew that it was writing the right value to the LCD. So I left that in as a function. So whenever I adjust any analog parameters on the front panel, it tells me what it is on the LCD. I've shared that with the 8279 address and I've just used an OR gate to trigger to pulse the enable of that LCD. And it's just straight to the data bus and it works quite well. So the front panel reads the analog pots, then it stores those values in RAM and then it outputs to a DAC. The reason I do that is so you can save that value. If you just wanted to make a synthesizer that you didn't save any sounds, you could just connect those pots straight to your analog hardware and you would only need a computer to basically read the keyboard and tell the timers, etc., what note to play. But because I want to save and retrieve sounds that I program, it has to go into RAM and then out to a DAC. And then you can save that RAM data as a patch and retrieve it. So there's a working block of RAM. So what you're currently working on, then you can save that into the storage RAM and then bring that back into the working RAM if you want to load a patch. So I say you could bypass if you didn't want to store any sounds. Onto the ADC. This chip has no memory. So how you've got to do it is you've got to set the address and start conversion. 
So you tell it what address you want, it triggers that start and ALE line here, address latch enable and start the conversion on the right. And then when you read it, you don't actually have to read it as an address. You can just, as long as you read the IO address, you don't need to read a chip address. That starts the chip converting. So if the data is read too quickly, it gives you incorrect results. So it's got a 500 kilohertz clock. So if you're running on a four megahertz CPU and you're reading that data, so if you latch and then try and read it straight away, you get inaccurate results. So what I've done on my new synth is I've used a flip-flop on this end of conversion EOC line here. I use a flip-flop that latches and that's cleared when I read the chip. So as soon as that end of conversion is read it, it latches. And then I read that value back by the CPU so I can carry on with the code and keep reading. So it reads it on a loop. So if that end of conversion flip-flops not being set, it just carries on with its program. So the ADC doesn't actually block the system from running it up. Because what I had to do when I first did it is put a delay in. So you started the conversion and then slot small delay and then read the value back. And if you have to do that eight times, that can block your code up. So that's why I did, I put an end of conversion flip-flop, read it back via an input. So I can just carry on with what I was doing, have a little counter as well, so I can know which one I'm on. If you're not sure about that, do fire away some questions at the end. That's a bit, a little bit confusing, but basically you've just got to know that the chip is ready. You could send that to an interrupt, but I've already used up my interrupt. So I just pull it. This is the front panel. So I've got my 8279 there again on the left, supporting logic. Two ADC 0828s going out to the pots on the front panel via those Molexes. A couple more supporting logic and some buffers to buffer the LED displays, the LED outputs, because this chip, the 8279, does all the multiplexing and everything for you, which I'll talk about now because it's on the next slide. If you've not used this chip before, I recommend you do because it's a fabulous chip. It can drive an 8x8 matrix of 64 keys, but with shift and control inputs as well, you can have 192 possible inputs. So you've got your 64 keys plus your shift plus your control. So you're controlling your key, shifting your key, you double your inputs already. So that's stored as a byte and it will do an interrupt. There is an IAQ output there on pin four, or you can pull it. In my case, I've just pulled it because that seems to work quite well. If there's a value there waiting to be read, it won't allow you to press anything else, but the CPU reads it quicker than I can press a button and I've never had any problems. Output wise, it can run up to 16 8 bit displays. So you can have 16 7 segments or 8 16 segments or just normal LEDs. You just need a transistor to ground them on the scan lines. You only have four scan lines here, but that's where you can stick that into an 8279 decoder and give you eight scan lines. Feed it with a 500 uh, kilohertz clock. It's got an internal divider to divide that clock down. It runs about 100 kilohertz, does the multiplexing, but it does all of the multiplexing for you. The outputs to the LEDs, it has RAM inside. So let's like say you can run up to 16, seven segments, 16 bytes of RAM. You just write to that RAM, forget about it. The CPU doesn't have to do any work. Once it's sent the data to this chip, the chip will do all the multiplexing and keep that value on the screen. For 1980, and it was a fabulous chip. On section two then, the A279 has multiple modes and one's called sensor matrix mode. So it reads the keyboard into an eight by eight bit RAM that is pulled by the CPU. So when I press a key on the keyboard, I want it to detect which key is pressed. So I know which note to play. Allocate a free voice. So any analog hardware that's not being used or not playing another note, look up the frequency from a table and set the timer. Because it's a 16 bit timer, trying to multiply that inside the Z80. We know the Z80 is not brilliant at math. So instead, I've just had a lookup table. So it jumps into a table, finds the frequency, sets the timers. It was the quickest way I could get to do it. And then it switches the gate output on so I know which voice, it triggers that voice to play. When the key's released, it frees up the allocated voice, so it turns it off, turns that timer, frees that voice variable up, and then switches the gate output off. The timer keeps running, because there's no need to stop that frequency because we've turned the output off, so this, it's not producing any sound. 
So it can still keep on whatever previous frequency it was. So it's less work to do when you release the key. Now, this is a complicated bit. This, this took me quite a while to run and program. This is the sensor matrix mode for the A279. So it reads it in eight bytes. So each block of eight keys is a bit on each byte. So what I have to do is I've had to do two loops, which are shown by the two different colors. The dark blue is the inner loop, the lighter blue is the outer loop. So what it does is it reads 8279's byte, which is eight keys worth of data, ends with one to get the bit we want, checks against a last state value in RAM. So I've got 64 bytes of RAM, which holds the previous state of every key, shifts it to the right. So we're only dealing with the bit zero each time and then loops back around again. If it detects a change between the RAM that's in the system and the RAM that's in the A279, it jumps to a routine which processes that change and that has to use the alternative set of registers so it can come back to the middle of this loop where it left off. So when I press a key, it knows that if that key's already been pressed, so it has to use a 64 bytes of RAM. There may have been other ways of doing it. This was quite early days in my programming of the Z80, and I can't think of any more efficient ways, and I've tried to modify the program, but because I've gone so far and it's quite embedded and there's lots of code, it's one of those things where I don't want to change it now. It works, and it works quite well. And I can even bash the keys really, really fast, and it won't miss any data. And then if it's scanned all those eight bits, it goes round and it does the next byte. So there's two eight, eight loops inside. So there's one outer loop, one inner loop. So if a, the reason I have the 64 bytes of RAM is because if a key is pressed and held, we don't want it to respond twice on its second loop because it will detect a change as it goes round again. But because that RAM variable will be set as one, it won't trigger that key again. So if I hold down a key, it will ignore it and be ready for the next key. So that's why I have the previous RAM to determine that change. A good thing about the A279 keyboard reader is you just issue a command to read the RAM with auto increment. So in the code here, you just load it with 80 and then out to your IO address with that value. Then when it does its first loop here, when it goes to the next loop, it will just auto increment that next byte of RAM within the A279 as it loops through and reads it all. Assigning a voice on the synth, I have six voices, like I've mentioned. They're shown here by these blue blocks. There is one byte of RAM allocated. That tells me if that voice is in use. So how I've done my assigning, I've done it sequentially. So if you press a key, it will assign voice one. If you press that same key again, it will assign voice two. And as you keep going, it will go through all six voices and back to the beginning again. The easy way of doing it is just by allocating the first voice down in the line. So if you're only pressing a couple of notes, only the first two voices will ever get used, the others won't do anything. So by doing this, it cycles through all the voices as it goes along the synth and you're playing the keyboard. How I've done that is I've got a counter running, which runs separately, goes, counts up each time you press a key and then resets if it overflows. The byte of RAM allocated for the voice empties zero. So if it finds that zero, so how it works is you press a key, you might already be on count number four because that's where you left it. So it will check that. If that note's in use, it will go to number three. If that's notes in use, it'll go to number two. If that's zero, it will allocate that voice, give it a value in RAM, so the note value you've pressed, lowest number is one, so zero is free, any other number isn't, so it's only checking for zero. And then when you press the next key, it will jump to the next note and play the next note in line. And if it hits the end, it resets. It goes down because it decrements rather than increments the count as we go along on the voice assigner. This took me quite a bit to program, because what I found is if you held down some keys in the middle, so if you already were using five and three, it kept missing it. So what it does now is if you're, if you're playing five and three, it will go six, four, two, one, and then go back to six, four, two, one, because it will go to five, 
see it's in use, go to four, see it's free, and then etc. It keeps going round and round and round. So if anything happened to that counter, it would mess up the whole loop. So that's why it's easier just to allocate the first one in line. So that just uses six bytes of RAM or however much you've got in the system. When we release a key, we have an envelope, which is how it manipulates the sound. Attack, decay, sustain and release is ADSR. So when you press the key, it triggers an envelope generator, which is an analog chip, which generates this curve. When you release a key, if you put some release on there, it will gradually lower that volume. So you'll hear the sound slowly stop. So another benefit of having the sequential voice assignment is if you release a key and you want that sound to slowly stop, if you allocate that key again, it will cut dead and start playing again. So it might sound a bit of a glitch on the keyboard. Modern day machines tend to detect if it's in its release phase and not reallocate that voice, but I didn't do that. So by having the sequential assignment, if you're pressing only one note and you've got a high release, it will keep going to the other four, the other five before it goes back again. Just gives it a little bit more chance to let that sound stop on the release phase. This is the envelope generator at the top. So there's six of these. The LEDs there trigger with each gate. So the gates come out of the CPU through this ribbon cable here, and that triggers through a buffer each one of these chips. And that also allocates, that then sends out to the voice. This is the DAC board down here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the DAC board in a minute, how I improved it. I've used individual DACs. I've gone for separate DACs. These are four, four channel 8 bit DACs. So I just use a series of address lines, supporting logic. And then that gives me four channels of DAC analog voltages because these chips here need four for the tactic case sustain release. There's two of these. So for each voice, you need eight DAC channels just for that. And then you have various other parameters on your analog hardware. 8254, again, another brilliant chip. The ones I've used in run up to 10 megahertz, but it depends on the chip. The 8253s, I think are limited at two and a half megahertz and you can't read the value back. The 8254s, it's essentially the same chip. It's just an enhanced later version where they improved it a lot and it can run up to 10 megahertz. I'm running mine on four megahertz two and one megahertz. So if I want to change the range of sound on my keyboard, there is a analog switch 4051. I think it's 4051, it's the four way one anyway. And that changes the frequency. So I've got a range switch on the top of my keyboard. And if I press a low, medium and high, it just changes the frequency going to this chip by one mega by half. So the standard is two megahertz. If I wanted to go down one, I go to one megahertz. Up one, I go to four megahertz. So you don't have to change any values. You just change the input frequency. Three independent 16-bit timers, which take two 8-bit writes. The best thing about this timer is it holds the count. I've tried to do a modern implementation of this on a pick using the timer zero and timer one, but you have to reset that count every time that timer interrupts in software. So you've got extra little bits to do with this. You just set it and leave it and it will carry on giving you that frequency because these were actually designed as baud rate generators for serial ports. And then Roland got hold of them and thought, oh, we can use these for synthesizers. They're really good. So I think originally they were in IBM PCs and various other timing circuits for that. And then because they did what they did and generated a 50% due to cycle square, they were perfect for a synth. 4052, sorry, I should have read my presentation, not 4051. 4052 switch selects between one, two and four megahertz. And then the MSB and the LSB data is held in a ROM table. So when that key is pressed, it looks up that value in ROM, writes it out to the 8254. The calculation is quite simple. You just divide the master frequency by the frequency you want and you get the timer. So you divide 4 million by 110 for 110 Hertz and it will give you the value of the frequency. I don't think the Z80 can multiply by 4 million somehow because it's a 16 bit address, 16 bit. So 
it's easier just to hold it in the ROM. And this is the analog hardware. From the left to right, there's three boards and I've used two voices on each, so it's two, four, six. And this does all the sound generation. So the square waves come in here at the top. Analog parameters come there from the DAX. Digital parameters come on the ribbon. And then all this is the analog gubbins and analog hardware, voltage control amplifiers, voltage control filters, all the others, the analog controls for the synth. So that's why I like doing the synths because you get to do everything. You've got all the analog stuff to design, then all the digital things that need to control the analog to make it all work. So improvements. I am currently designing my next machine, which is slow progress due to cost. And it's designed on the Profit 5 synth, which is a big synth and a big project for me to undertake. I'm reading the ADC with non-blocking code. So it carries on doing its stuff, checks that end of conversion line, and then comes back to read the value if it's detected that it's finished. I'm using sample and hold from the DAX rather than have individual DAX. And I'm having a big master board with a bus connection with all the common parameters rather than have ribbon and Molex jumping between each analog voice. I'm having one big board and then a bus lines running down the PCB to do all the analog and digital parameters. So that's what I'm doing on the new machine. I'll quickly talk about sample and hold before we finish. Sample and hold is having one DAC. When DACs were expensive in the 80s, they tended to use the Profit 5 and I think the Jupiter 8 and other various synths of the time used 12 or 14 bit DACs. As they released later versions of the same machine, because they improved them as the 80s went on, they increase the DAC capacity. So if you get a really early Profit 5 or Jupiter 8, you might only have an 8-bit DAC. Then they did a 12-bit DAC, and I think they went up to a maximum of a 14-bit DAC. But because DACs were expensive and they needed so many analog parameters, from memory, the Profit 5 that I'm designing, the Profit 5 style, uses about 25 analog channels. So to have 25 14-bit DACs in the 80s would just be ridiculously expensive and so many components. So to do this, you have sample and hold. So what you do is you have one DAC, 4051 8-bit multiplexer. So you set the analog value, then you set which one of these you want to switch. It's got a capacitor to hold the value. It's simplified here on the left. Capacitor holds the value on the op amp. It's just a unit of gain, voltage follow buffer. Because that's very high impedance, the output here you can draw a lot higher current and it doesn't drain this capacitor. If you put the capacitor there, it will just keep draining all the time. So it just holds the analog value until the next loop. So it keeps looping round and round and round, sets the DAC, sets that one. So you set the value you want on the top one, write it to the output, set the DAC for the next one, write it to the output, and it keeps refreshing this on the loop as it goes around. And I've implemented this quite successfully on my latest CPU board, which is this one here. So it's exactly the same board, I've just modified it. So this is the next version. I've used the same oscillator, CPU, ROM and RAM, same 8279 to read the keyboard. I've put an 8255 chip here because I had one spare rather than the two latches. I'm not using half the functionality that I can. I've just done it because I had the chips. Same timers, just NEC ones and UART and decoder. So this is a sample and hold board on the left. I have, on my next one, I'm using a voltage control, so I need higher resolution. So I'm using a 12-bit parallel DAC. This was 12 quid from RS, this chip. So it was a quite a expensive chip and took a bit of work because I didn't want to blow it up by putting too high a voltage on it by mistake and ended up spending another 12 quid. It's a parallel DAC with no latching, which is quite good. So I'm using 12 bits out of here, straight into that DAC, and then that DAC goes out to these op amps. And then I have an 8-bit DAC here, which go to the top op amps, because the normal parameters are just 8-bit. And then I've got multiplexers here, and then I have a 138 decoder. So the process is write the value to the DAC, 
and then write the value to the multiplexer and then you use the inhibit line on the multiplexer as your switch. So when you've written your address, you pulse that, sorry, click my mouse, pulse that multiplexer and then that will write that voltage to these capacitors. And what I found was I used 100 nanofarad at first and then I used 10 nanofarad on the ones I wanted to change quickly but I realized that that was changing quite slowly. So these are actually one nanofarad caps. So you don't need big caps at all in sample and hold. These need to change quite frequently because as soon as you press a key, these values need to change as soon as you press that key. So the lower value, the better. For these, this is just what you're setting your program of your synth to. So they can change slowly, it doesn't really matter. So there, a little bit more about the patch storage just to clear anything up. When you're saving the, you've set all your parameters on your front panel, that's read by the ribbon cable here on a separate board. That's been written into memory, which is this chip. Using the software, that's then written out to the DAX on the corresponding channels. If you save that value, it saves it to this chip, which has the battery plug. And then using the keys on the front panel, you can retrieve that block of RAM, block of data, put it back into working RAM, then that will then write back out to the DAX and out to your synth. So this is two kilobytes. So I've allocated 16 bytes for my current project, the one that's finished, and I'm allocating more to the next one. I always do it in blocks of 16, just so it's easy to calculate. So if there's some spares at the end, it doesn't really matter because I'm not going to use two kilobytes worth. I'm probably only going to save about, give it the option to save about 50. So that is the uh, Z80 and the synth. So, anything, questions you want on that and clear that up? Are there are any questions so, we are, anybody has. So you mentioned all the analog parameters. Maybe you could just give a, uh, what, what are they? What, what parameters can you change? Oh, well, okay. The parameters you can change. So on the oscillator, you have your pulse width modulation of your square. So you, you, pulse width of your, so you can change that. It's normally it's 50%, but you can change it up or down. That changes the sound characteristics quite a lot. Then you have your, you can have a mixer. So if you have two oscillators, you can turn the volume between the two mixer. The sub oscillator, which is an octave below, so it's divided by two, the level of that. You've got your cutoff frequency on your filter, the resonance control of your filter. The envelopes, attack, decay, sustain, release on your filter and your amplifier. Because on the synth, you've got two sections. Your amplifier is your final bit, what you hear. So the envelope there is the chip sound. So if you want a string sound, you want it to start nice and slowly. So you put more attack on there, so the sound will gradually build up. If you want a bass sound, you might have no attack at all. So it's just boom, boom, boom. And the filter just changes the parameters of that cutoff frequency because the synthesizer is called subtractive synthesis. There's many different types of synthesis out there. Subtractive is the easiest and the most popular in the analog world. You start off with your raw square wave or your raw saw wave. You might add another square wave in there. You might stick another oscillator in there that's a lower frequency, just to give you that detune kind of effect. And then that goes into the filter where you use your cutoff frequency to tweak out any of that high level and get your sound down to what you like. And then the, the envelope generator can then trigger that, that cutoff frequency. So when you press a key, it can respond to the key press. And you've got attack, decay, sustain, release. So attack is how long it takes the sound to start. Decay goes, to, is it, uh, how long it takes to well, decay down a bit. Sustain is a volume level, a voltage level. So attack, decay, and release are time values. Sustain is a level. So you go up on your attack, down to your sustain, and then your release is when you press, take your key off, it goes down onto the nothing. So from that sustain level to nothing. So on a bass sound, you might want it to start and stop really, really quick, but on a string sound, you want it to start slowly and then stop slowly as well. So that's some examples of analog parameters that you can set that's read by that front panel and saved into the RAM. On my Juno style, I don't have as many, but on the Profit 5 style, I've got a lot more because I've got two oscillators. So I've got two sets of PWM. I've got a mixer there so I can get oscillator one, two, and the sub. Then I've got the envelopes and the filter, the attack, the attack to case sustain release, and the cutoff and resonance and things. 
So there's many different things. Depends on your design, how many analog parameters you can have. And is that sort of? I think you said it's it's it's, it's broadly equivalent to a um, a Juno. You said so in terms of. Yes, this this is my my attempt is against the Juno. Even though I'm not using the same CPU, I'm using the same time as an analog circuitry, not the same computer circuitry. The Juno actually had two microcontrollers in there for some reason. It had a slave microcontroller and a master one with a serial link between the two, which I thought was a bit odd, but must be a cheap way of doing it back then. The Juno was designed to be cheap. It was the cheaper synth. That's why so many are still about. It was... It's Greek mythology of Jupiter, and then Juno was Jupiter's wife. So that's where Roland's got the names from, I think, I believe, for a bit of trivia. So the Juno was the cheaper version, or the wife of the big Jupiter. Cool. Um, you, you mentioned you had MIDI support. So how, how did you manage to get sort of um, MIDI working alongside with the, key, with the uh, playing live the keyboard? There's a couple of videos on my channel actually where I struggled to get that going because I had a bit of an issue where if you played a couple of notes too fast, it got stuck. And that was just a variable that I wasn't backing up because what happens, obviously, when you jump into the ISR, you need to back up all your registers because your ISR has priority. So it could be doing anything in that code. You've no idea what it could be doing. It could be reading the keyboard, reading the front panel, doing anything. But I had a variable that I wasn't backing up. So occasionally, that would get messed up and then stick the note. So how the MIDI works is it's reading three bytes of data from the UART, which is the note on, the command and the value and the velocity. I'm ignoring velocity, but you still have to read it. You just ignore it in your software. Then that then just calls the same routine as the rest of the program, which allocates the RAM the same way as the key bed does. So you're just doing this essentially the same, it's calling the same routine but just from a different source. But you've got to make sure you back up those registers the right way. So I have to use the push and pop on the mid-air because I'm already exchanging registers with the key bed. So it's got a little bit more complicated. I'm not doing it in my next one. I'm not doing MIDI. I'm ignoring it. I'm not doing a, I'm not doing a MIDI on the next one. Instead, I'm trying to do tape storage so you can store the contents of the RAM to tape. That's the next challenge. Okay, yeah, because I, I was going to ask if you if you'd implemented something because you know MIDI can do patch control, so you could in theory sort of uh, can, yes, yes. Back, 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 back it back it back it up to your computer but you, you, over MIDI, but I guess you're, you're not doing that. They didn't do patch control back then. Patch control came a lot later. Even the Juno doesn't really do patch control. It, it was a lot, lot later in the eighties that they started with that one. I think that was a MIDI two spec. Yeah, I, I came fairly late to MIDI, so when it's when it all uh, and MIDI clock as well. MIDI clock was uh, quite a new thing. This doesn't accept MIDI clock, it just ignores it. So it, sorry. When when you when you're playing live on this, yeah. I guess you you can switch between patches. Yeah, you can switch between patches live. So how how do you how you actually do that? Is there like keys on the keyboard to select between them or Buttons yeah. or... If I go back to the, sorry, I've just lost the screen share, but I'll do it again. I just escaped my presentation. I'll just go back to the front. So I'll go back to the front panel and the machine. So here I've got the patch control. So these buttons here do the patch control. That's the oscillator controls with the PWM and the sub level. That controls just the sound volumes. That's the filter envelopes. So when you press one of these blue buttons, you do the patch control and the, L the LED display will tell you which patch you're on. It does work live. If you're really hammering the keyboard and you press the patch, you might get stuck on a sound if it's on its release phase. But if you just carry on playing the key, because obviously you've, you've changed the analog parameters halfway through playing a note, so you're gonna get a bit of a glitch. But you'd never do that if you were playing live. You wouldn't. You'd just change the patch before you started to play. But it does work. It doesn't crash. It, it does work quite well. Have you? Do you actually play? I do play. I'm not a fantastic player, but I do play. Yes, mostly I sequence. So I play something, sequence it, and then layer it up like that. So I don't have to be. You don't have to be a good player mm. to be able to sequence these days with computer software and using MIDI. 
there is a YouTube on my YouTube channel. There is a there is my cheesy eighties uh, OMD playing on this machine. A demo of playing that on this on this synth. When oh, I go, we got a link to your channel. I can send you a link to the channel. Yeah, no problem. I'll uh, copy that link in now. Just have to. Uh, YouTube's annoying me at the moment because every time you go on it, it wants you to sign in. So this is a, hang on, where's my Zoom? Back to my, if I stop sharing and get back, I can put it in the chat there. There we go, that links to my channel, so we can uh, you can have a look, have a look at some sound demos. There is the, the first video that opens on the channel is when I'm playing it alongside the Juno 106. So after I built this machine, I decided I was gonna buy the Juno because I, I said funnily in one of my video vlogs, the amount of money I've spent on this, I could have just bought the Juno 106. And then I thought, oh, I might actually buy a Juno 106. So I did, and I tried to compare the two. Obviously, it is a different machine, but the sound you can get the same sounds because mine mine actually has something that the Juno 106 doesn't have for the synth buffs there. I'll just put that back on share. What I've done is I have routed the envelope to modulate the PWM, which does a really, really nice effect. And the Juno didn't do that. So when you've done your sounds, you can modulate things i did i'll talk more about synths if, if anybody wants to talk a little bit more about synths but i wanted to concentrate this on tomorrow the computer side rather than the uh, synth electronic side but i'm happy to talk about you know the synth theory and the analog bits if anybody's interested or i can maybe do that as a separate separate thing if anybody is interested in that well whether whether you do it now or whether you do it at a later date that's um that is something that i'm because i kind of i understand some of the from a programming point of view i understand all the digital stuff not necessarily from the electronics point of view but i've kind of got a rough idea of it whereas analog kind of blows my mind it's not a <clears throat> with, with digital you can kind of you can you can see bits on the yes screen. yes of course in, yeah. in, in memory you can kind of like calculate things as soon as stuff gets to do with sound um i i really struggle kind of like um tying the sound up with with values because the sound you can't see it and it's constantly changing and kind of getting your idea about how certain values um like um sure yeah produce certain sounds kind of blows my mind a bit well you you need an oscilloscope the, the, you know where you can't work on any analog without with oscilloscope you can see you i couldn't do it without it you have to be able to see what's going on with those values so back to the synth voice this is a very very basic synthesizer so if you forget your computer bit for a second and we'll just concentrate on analog the oscillator gives you your raw waveform so this can be voltage controlled which the CEM or the modern clone AS3340 is a voltage controlled oscillator. Mine is digital, so that's your timer. That goes into an op amp, which makes a saw wave. If you, if you want to look through my channel, I do talk about the, how, how the analog works because it's quite a complex subject and I have done some videos covering it. So I don't want to bore everybody with that now or go on too long because it is, it is a complex subject. But then it goes into the filter so you've got your controls for your filter, which is your cutoff frequency. It's a low pass filter. So you, your cutoff is what your high level you're cutting off. So as you turn your cutoff down, you're turning that raw saw wave into a nicer wave. So rather than you know, you've got a that kind of thing. Then that goes into your voltage controlled amplifier, which is what you hear. That is on amplitude of your ADSR and the velocity, which I ignore because the 80s ignored velocity. It's a fairly new thing. That's how hard you hit the key. Modern synths do it. So if you press a key soft, they try to mimic a piano. Because you imagine a piano is a fully polyphonic keyboard. You can press every key because it's hitting a hammer. 
when you're trying to do that with electronics, it's harder. So that velocity of a piano, the, the softer you hit the key, it doesn't hit that string as hard. The harder you hit the key, it bashes that string. Because a piano is a stringed instrument, isn't it? It's just a keyboard to control it. When synthesizers came out, they tried to, they didn't try to mimic pianos. Synthesizers in the 80s were like electric guitars. In the 60s, it was a never before heard sound. That's why so many 80s bands did so well with that, such a unique sound. Starting off with craft work, really, in the early days, and then Depeche Mode, OMD, all around that same time, Human League, all. So if you were a drummer in the 80s, it wasn't your time. Everything was drum machines. Not, all, not The Z80 was drum machines as well. I haven't covered talked about drum machines because it's not something I'm really interested in, at drum machines. But they did them as well. So Z80, you Roland. 808 drum machine, again, they're expensive these days, your Lin drum. I'm not sure if they all use Z80, but a lot did, just to sequence your drums. And a lot was sample-based as well. It's an area I've not gone into as a sample-based. I've not, I want to get, the next stage is to get a wavetable oscillator. So there is a video on a wavetable oscillator. That is using a binary counter, eight bits of RAM, and then a DAC. So you write your 256 values for your waveform, and then that will write out to the DAC. But I digress a little bit on that one there, if you want to, with the analog hardware. So even though my synthesizer or the Juno 106 was digitally controlled, people get confused. It wasn't a digital synthesizer. It was just the waveform was digitally stable. The output was pure analog because that square wave was converted to a saw wave, which was analog. Later on, they tried to use digital signal processing and even modern machines do that. But that this, this is not a digital synth. It's an analog synth, but it uses a digital to control. Because if you imagine one volt per octave, that's going to be very hard to calibrate. One volt per 12 notes is only a few millivolts per step. On an eight bit DAC, it's pretty impossible. You need at least a 12 bit. So back in the eighties, that was a lot of tuning problems. The Prophet fives in the early days, were just tuning headaches. A lot of synths were brilliant synths, but people couldn't tour with them because they were kept detuning. So I think that's where Roland came out with the Juno. So thought, this will never go out of tune. This is a fantastic machine. People can take it on tour. It won't need any maintenance. I think that's why they made so many and they're still so popular today. If it's any consolation, Phil, I've been, I've been following Richard's channel for like, a year or something and i kind of get the concepts but yeah it's still all of this analog stuff is escaping me <laughs> i'm very firmly planted in the digital world yeah but, i think that's why I, that's why i like it because like i've said i said at the early early on in this presentation that that's why i chose synthesizers because you have got that option to do analog and digital and connect them together so you've got to read those pots. You've got to manipulate that value. That value is digital, zero to 255. But then you've got to get that back to a voltage again using a DAC. So you get to do everything. That's why I quite like doing synths. And you, you learn about it. I, I didn't know anything about synths when I started. It's just learned by doing for me. I just started on a breadboard, got the oscilloscope, connected an amplifier up to it, saw what was going on, did some more research. I started actually by building a kit I built a vault, an oscillator and filter and everything from a kit. And then I got some circuits and I just started building it all up. And everything just built up from, from nothing really. I just started breadboarding it and then I started doing more and learning more. And it's where I am now. And this, this machine probably took me about two years from start to finish because I did it all slowly, did it carefully, tested everything out, designed the PCBs. The thing with analog is it's not as complicated as what you think, it's just a varying voltage. So instead of that digital being zero to 255, your analog represents zero to five volts. So you just divide 255 by the five volts and that's your analog scale in your digital. So when you're converting between the two, just think it as a varying voltage. And even a waveform, if you're dealing with a square wave, essentially you've technically got an analog wave. If you've got a, a square wave, it still can be used for analog purposes. Yeah, I think um, these days, the, the thing that I kind of 
um, still struggle with is filters because I can I've got I've got a concept of I know what a, a like a square wave or a sine wave at a certain frequency would look like in terms of yeah. voltages, but then when you say oh yeah and then you put it through a filter that takes out these frequencies and you're like yeah but how how does that how does that actually work and I I've I figured out that I can't actually cope with any kind of maths unless someone presents it to me in the form of like a C program. So yeah. whenever I see whenever I see people like do um, um, any kind of like math equations, you kind of Google stuff and it's like to yeah. do yeah. Um, like to do with signal processing or something like that, and you have all of these like complex math equations. I'll look at that and go. I don't understand that at all. Show me some C code yeah. and I'll kind of, I might have some idea of roughly kind of how that works. And I'll be perfectly honest, I don't fully understand how a filter works. I just got the chip, got the data sheet, built the circuit, gave it the voltages and, and it listened to it and it works. Uh, it uses the, this is the filter I use. Can you see my web browser there? Or am I still on the presentation? And you're on the presentation. I'll stop that. Hang on, get that. Sharing a particular window. Yeah. Your mouse clicking around, but we can't see what you're doing. You can see your mouse clicking around. Yeah, desktop one, that'll be it. So I use this. This is my filter. So it might look complicated. Now, and I don't understand what on earth's going on. It's all about capacitors charging and discharging and all that malarkey. But I build it, put your input, give it your voltages on your frequency control and then get the output to an oscilloscope. And I don't understand what's going on inside it. Thanks to this man, Doug Curtis, in the early eighties that designed these chips. I don't think any of these synths would have existed if he hadn't have designed the chips. Because all the filter stuff is on one chip. It's not using hundreds of op amps and hundreds of capacitors. You've got your external components, but it's all on this one chip. And the modern clone is the AS3320. You can still buy them, but it's cloned, but it's pretty much been compatible for the old data sheet. So that's how I do it. I don't understand any of this nonsense, all this PPM and all this millivolt per decade. I just build it, listen to it, and that's how that's how I do it. I don't get bogged down, bogged down with that. I like to understand how stuff works, but sometimes it just does, and that's how I see it. It just works. Yeah, I think um, sound for me, um, in about 1984, I tried um, doing stuff with sound on a Commodore 64 from BASIC. Yeah. Couldn't work out what the hell I was going on, and then probably spent another, th and then spent 30 years saying I'm never going to deal with anything to do with sound ever again. <laughs> See, my, my days with that, I, I was only born in the 80s, so... I know I'm interested in all the old 80s tech, but it's because I love the 80s music because I grew up with the 80s music. So it's sort of, I should have been born, I should have been around in the 80s. I think it'd been a great time of electronics. But around my first dealings with it was just DOS, Adlib, Sound Card, Sound Blaster, 16 bit, when it got a little bit more advanced back then with the DOS games, you could never get the sound to play properly. Some sound cards just didn't work. I've never done anything with the 64 or the SID chip or the, or the spectrum for that matter with sound generation. Well, the, um, so the, um, going back to you saying about the, the wave table, yeah. I think when they, um, when they originally designed the, um, the SID in the 64, the guy that, um, designed it, I think wanted to do a wave table. Yeah. Um, but they didn't have, um, they didn't memory. have they didn't have the space on the chip for it. Yeah. Um, so it, it generates the um, it basically just has a counter that gets fed through to create different waveforms. So it just has a incrementing counter. Right. You, I see. So you you get a saw wave just by using the raw counter. Um, you get a triangle by it inverting when it yeah. hits the top and things like that. But I've got a, a th I don't know if he, I mean, unfortunately, the guy, um, he went on to do Ensonic, um, which did like um, PC sound chips, and I think it was used in some um, synthesizers. But yes, um, 
yeah, slightly bef about a year before they designed the Commodore 64, um, Pac-Man um, was in the arcades, and that actually used a wavetable um, synthesis. Like all the sounds are like wait, wait. made up of like um, I think it's like eight byte samples. Yeah. Well, wa wavetable and samples are slightly different thing. They do get confused. The emulator two, which uh, is a Z80 machine, that was sample based, so you could actually record a sound. That's a little bit more complicated because of the frequencies. I think it's 41.4, isn't it, for the normal audio sample rate. A wavetable is just a value of your waveform. So if you want a sine wave, you start from zero and you want to get to 255, but you want to go so maybe zero, yeah. five, ten, da 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 da. Then that goes. And so you only do your half of your wavetable and then your binary counter loops through that RAM. I've done a video on one that actually did a wavetable with, with a chunk of two kilobyte RAM. So I use a Z80 because Z80 is not powerful enough to read a ROM and output to a DAC at the right frequency, because obviously on an on an eight bit wavetable with 256 addresses, you need to multiply your output frequency by 256, and that because you need to run it faster than your actual output because you need to make sure you get through the table in the time that you want the output waveform to be. So you need to run that counter faster. The Z80 is not powerful enough. So the, the machine that, that did wavetable back in the day was this was the PPG wave, this beast. And this was a, and the, these are thousands to buy now. And this was one of your first wavetable synthesizers that used that technology to create an analog wave on using RAM. And then they went to sample based. It was quite a, a busy decade for development of things before they got onto digital. That's why I think it's so sought after now, because at that point, it's like vinyl, isn't it? Everybody want, didn't want vinyl anymore. CDs were brilliant. And then everybody loves vinyl again. All goes around in circles. Well, cassettes, that, haven't, cassettes haven't made a resurgence though. Uh, the entire um, house music genre only existed because someone had made um, some effect, was it an effect, I think it was, was it an effects unit or something? And no one wanted it. So they were all um, being just, pe some people had bought them and just like were selling them secondhand really cheap. And these poor people who wanted to create music bought them up and thought, I will give that a go and see what that, because it was quite an interesting kind of um, sound effect. And that's how acid house music kind of like came about was because because the, the music industry had abandoned this effect unit really cheap really quickly yeah um but, it but, had its own but, but rather than being able to rather than having to buy it full price they could buy it cheap of course now again they're sought after and are actually more expensive than you could than have bought in the first place yes, imagine well one one thing that is is real to real tape recorders they are seriously expensive nowadays. They really are. I've got one. I've got a Tascam 32. It doesn't work incredibly well. It does work, but it doesn't work incredibly well. It needs a serious service, but even parts are expensive on them. It must be worth a fortune in the future, that thing must. I was still, I, I did hospital radio for a while and probably, I mean, it's probably 20 years now ago. We, we actually used reel to reel um, before before PCs yeah. really kind of took off in terms of being able to record audio and then edit it and play it back. Um, they'd use reel to reel to record um, like new like sports stuff off yeah. the radio, edit yeah. it up and then play it out on hospital radio. And so you got the guy with the razor blade cutting Cut the tape, tape. Yeah. Like and then filming the yeah, it was, um, I mean, maybe it was slightly more than 20 years ago. It was probably in the late 90s. Because I think we, I think we switched over to Cool Edit um, in the late yeah. 90s. Well, I, I did quite well with my real thrill because I volunteer at our local theatre and everyone, everyone there is just voluntary. And I usually do sound tech or lighting tech. I've done both. I've run shows and lights and sound, but I like doing the sound. 
we use Showq Systems PC software now. And there was a reel-to-reel under the table, full covered in dust. So I was just asking around anybody and, and I just said, oh, what, what are you doing with that? I'll, I'll give you 50 quid for it. And they're like, yeah, okay. We was going to get rid of it. So I've got a reel-to-reel of 50 quid for it. So if it's worth a lot in the future, I did quite well with that. I know you um, started talking about lights. I know someone who um, built a um, computer-controlled lighting rig using a BBC Micro in probably the early 80s. That was that was um, pretty cool. It was like in the community centre in Brightlingsea. Um, I assume they've taken it out because the the guy that designed it is like retired and probably not involved with it anymore. And I think no one really understood how it all worked apart from him. Yeah. But it was um, it was it was pretty good. It was all um, all of the the lights were individually controlled and everything. It was so yeah, just, but pre DMX. It's just probably multiplexed output. It wouldn't be DMX on a BBC, would it? It's far too advanced. Yeah. Yeah. Richard. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, with my early exp experimentation with sound. Um, off the back of things like the Acorn Music 500 system or a single chip, um, the SM764 777N, which was a, a synth on a chip. Um, I was always very disappointed with the results because the sound was very harsh. Um, and I listened to a lot of electronic music in the past, and the likes of Tangerine Dream, Dan Gellis, and Jean Michel Jean. Um, and I just, there was, such a difference between the two sounds. It was only until I discovered effects units. Uh, one of the first ones that I used was a Pandy spring delay, which is awful because if you tap it, you can actually hear the springs reverberate as well. Yeah, and yeah, then I think, <laughs> And then I got myself a micro 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 verb two, which is a digital um, effects unit, and that just brought everything alive. Uh, the sound became more epic and warm so just wondering if you've toyed with um the idea of adding effects onto your your synth and what it might sound like well yes the juno actually has a chorus a bucket brigade delay bucket brigade device chorus and that does alter the characteristic of the sound quite a lot i used a pt2399 which i think is a 90s chip i did a chorus circuit with that just to add on to mine but a lot of people even now still use guitar pedals for synths just to get that different sound with the effects. A lot of modern ones you buy have effects already built in. So it's still a very big thing to get that unique sound out of the synth still using usually chorus or reverb effects. But I think back in the early computers, even in the acorns, they were just crap 8-bit sound chips. They didn't have analog hardware as such. They just tried to do everything on one chip. So it didn't it didn't really work all that well. There's nothing like the actual. I'd have to say in the defense in, in the defense of the music five hundred, that, that did have quite a nice sound in actual fact. It was a, a little bit more sophisticated because it was a, a box, uh, the sound circuitry was separate from the BBC and the BBC was just controlling uh, oh, yeah, the internal yeah, synth. Yeah. I'm not familiar with the five thousands and how they really worked in the sound. They were 32-bit machines, weren't they? So they would have been a bit more advanced. The, the Archimedes you're talking about, the 5000. Oh, oh no, before the Archimedes. So this, this was something that would attach to the BBC Micro B. Oh, sorry. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were and talking um, about the Archimedes. No, no, no. Before then, so it's an eight-bit microprocessor, six five zero two, yeah, and the BBC, yeah. Um, but it's all the rage now that people uh, working in music and electronic music want to circuit bend like old hardware, yes, and try and get right, it to... yeah. quite popular. So, hence this idea of adding effects. I just wonder how your device would sound with some, uh, you know, throw some effects at it and get some really complex kind of ambient kind of sounds uh, be intriguing to uh, to hear something like that yeah I, mean, I can i can have a look at building some effects or buying a cheap effects unit and sticking it through through and, and doing some of that yeah it would be quite interesting it does sound okay with the chorus i built or it's a little bit 
crude it's not the best but you do need some kind of effect reverb's always a good one just to iron out any little glitches that might happen and same with the chorus just to beef up that sound but i do also have a unison mode on this as well which i didn't actually talk about it the unison mode in my terms turns it into a three voice synth and when you press the key it fires two voices but it detunes one of the voices so it gives you that extra uh, fifth so any any few however musicians out there it's a perfect fifth it detunes it by so it doesn't sound wrong but it just gives you that little bit extra edge on the two sounds when they mix together because uh, playing guitar power chords basically <laughs> uh, yeah power chords perfect fifth that exactly yeah yeah that's where the popularity of your electric guitar with the two notes i hadn't thought of it like that yeah but there is this perfect fifth so i added that in but it's not a digital effect i need to explore the realms of effects something i can do when i build the next one maybe add a few more effects into it certainly something to look at in the future So I've got a question. Um, would you say, like for your next synth, that there were particular lessons that you learned from the first one that you will try to fix or implement better um, in uh, in the next synth? Like in particular, because I know you mentioned, like for example, I think that the um, that the keyboard scanning stuff was very heavily integrated into the software. Like, have you? thought of or come up with any ways to sort of modularize things a little bit to make it easier to kind of plug out one sort of keyboard scanning routine and plug in something else? Yeah, I, I'm i not completely au fait with how the 80s since scan the keyboard. I believe they use the address lines and use the address lines as a scan and the data lines as a return. And it was heavily done in software. I opted for the 8279 because I'm, it's just easier and I can offload it to that chip and not worry about it. So I don't think I'll change that, but there are a few lessons. There's quite a lot of lessons. One is the DAX. I'm going to use a sample and hold for the DAX. Definitely for the ADC, I'm going to read that end of conversion line and get the, the ADC to read back properly so it doesn't block the code because the, it's quite a fiddly little chip to read because it doesn't have any memory of its own. You've got to... I would say you had to start it off and then read it when it finished its conversion. Those are the lessons I've learned with it. As far as the analog goes, there's just really just resistor values and op amp mixer values that I need to change. There's not a great deal in the analog. There isn't actually a great deal in the digital. I've just improved the DAX and improved the ADC. Everything else is, is actually quite pretty much the same. I mean, how, how do analog synthesizers vary them i mean does the analog um part get any more complex i mean do, is there is there value in adding extra filters or more oscillators or does that just does that just not help if you add more complexity there well more you can you can again it's up to the design and, and obviously cost i think that's why the juno opted for one oscillator digitally controlled because it was designed to be the cheaper synth the jupiter 8 i mean it's so expensive now but the Jupiter 8 in the 80s was, was massive. It was heavy. I've never ever seen one, but I've in person, but they're absolutely massive. And they actually did keyboard split, did this. So it actually, you could actually have upper and lower. So it needed to double everything again. But the, that added extra complexity, obviously. But the big thing about synths is more modulation. It's more having something else control something else. That's where you get your unique sounds. So in the likes of mine, I have routed the envelope generator, that envelope curve, to modulate the PWM. So when you press the key, that envelope curve will be triggered. That will also change the PWM. So on your analog waveform, the PWM will adjust as you when you press the key. So it does make a big difference to the sound. Another one is, I mean, on, on the Profit 5, you've got something called Polymod, which routes various parameters to various other things so you can you can use one oscillator to control the frequency of another oscillator and that gets like your laser sounds because you're quickly changing the frequency using another frequency so you can get into absolute complexity i mean i've got a modern profit rev 2 and that's got so many modulation routing options you it's unbelievable but it's dsp so 
it's easier for them to implement in software. If you're doing it analog, you've got to wire it all up. And then for the polyphony to make more than one voice, you've got to duplicate everything. So I think that's why for the Juno, it was actually pretty straightforward. So you, it can be endless. It's, you can have so many different things, but it's more about that modulation. Once you've got your raw sound, once you've got your oscillator going to your filter and to your amplifier, it's about what else can you do? So then you've got LFOs, which are low frequency oscillators that oscillate maybe like four or five hertz that you might put into that filter. And that might give you like a kind of sound. Or you can put that in your PWM as well. So you modulate that. Your saw wave, you can't do much with. It's a saw wave. But your, your square or your pulse, if you imagine your waveform changing that pulse width 50% from zero to 100%, but you could control that as you press the key. So when you press the key, it went from zero to 100. You're going to hear that. And that's going to then pass through the rest of your circuitry. And that was a really good feature I put on it. The sound wouldn't have been as good if I hadn't have done that by having that routing back. So yeah, it's just such a, so many things you can do. One thing like Tom, I, I have learned, I'm going to put a pitch bend on. I'm definitely going to put a pitch bend, which for some reason, all through the eighties was called bender. And now it's not called a pitch bend. I just find that quite in British humor. I just find that quite amusing. That at some point in the eighties, somebody thought we better not call this bender anymore. We'll call it pitch bend instead. <laughs> So on, on the Juno, that's what it actually says. So I'm implementing one of them and I've got a modulation wheel as well. That's another thing you can do. So on the, on the profit here, I don't know if you can see those buttons very well, but the mod wheel, you can, when you turn that wheel yourself, you can send that value. So it's just a voltage. You can send that voltage to the frequency of both oscillators, the PWM of both oscillators on filter. So as you're playing, you can use that wheel to change your frequency as you're playing. So it's not something done with the sound. It's done when you've done by yourself. So you can be playing. You can go, like, not the best at doing a synthesizer. Not, not one of these beatboxes. So you have to just bear with my little vocal oscillations there. <laughs> so yeah, it's completely endless what you can do. Difficult with analog because it's circuitry, it's chips, it's a lot, but it's easier with DSP. Now, interestingly, Roland have released the desktop version of the Juno and they've released Jupiter as well, but they've used what they call analog modeling, which is essentially just DSP. And it tries to do what the analog used to do, but it's not analog. I think that's why, again, these are so popular. Even though the Juno 106 isn't a fantastic synth, compared to features, there's very few controls. There's only one oscillator, there's only one envelope. It just seems incredibly popular even today. I think it's just because it looks cool and it's got a cool name. And that's what made them like Jupiter. Just for like, um, for like retro computer hobbyists, it would be a bit like using a, an actual Z80 or 6502 CPU versus um, you know, one that's implemented on an FPGA. Like, you know, it does the same thing. Um, yeah. but you know, it's just not the same. <laughs> no, no, I understand. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to do it on the pick, but I find it harder on the pick because you've got to change that value every interrupt. So you've got to keep that reset your timer almost, haven't you? If you use timer one or timer zero on your picks. But I'm I'm using that because I'm I'm building a Juno based synth that I'm hoping to do as like a kit. I know I've been saying I've been doing it for a while, but I'm hoping to build something that I can sell on or at least sell the designs, PCBs, etc., so people can build their own Juno style synth. So I'm doing it digitally controlled. I'm using a pick and I'm, I'm doing it quite simple so it can be easily built by people rather than do something too complex. It's not going to have patch storage. It's just going to have your potentiometer straight to your value, but it might be interesting for people to actually build it a full working machine. MIDI controlled, not keyboard controlled, no, completely MIDI controlled. Because surprisingly, key beds, the actual keyboard assemblies, are so hard to find. I bought mine on eBay and I bought a second one on eBay as well, but you just, you just can't find them. 
I can't find where to buy them new. It's just strange to me how something that must be manufactured in the masses, you just can't seem to buy. Are they, um, are like, are they sort of very specific to a particular style or like? A yeah, I think they are manufacturer specific to the case and the design. But yeah, I, I even contacted like contacted Soundgas and said, "Do you have any key beds?" I said, "No, we won't sell them. We need them for the machines we sell. We don't, we won't sell them." So you can find a broken one, but they're normally going to need a lot of restoration. You know, on the because they're just carbon contacts with a little rubber push button. So you can imagine 30, 40 years later, they're not going to work very well unless they've been made. Uh, to. I'm sort of wondering, like, is it the kind of thing like you could buy like a you know a cheapy keyboard from you know the local electronics retailer and then take a key bed out of, or are they just like basically molded in? No, they're molded. I nicked one from work or borrowed, sorry, from work to see if I could get the key bed out of it. A little, you know, one of them Yamaha kids keyboards. And it was just all molded into the plastic. But this, mine, is an actual metal assembly. So right. dad built the case around it. And yeah, that's like, what's yeah. it. She's got some screws underneath that hold the metal assembly in place. And I just have the two wires, the two sets of wires that connect into the, if you can see the picture, the other one's just standing there at the back, ready to go into the next machine. But it's surprisingly hard to find. I, I don't know why. Are the electronic organ keyboards similarly it's hard to find now? Uh, I've, I've, you mean that is... Okay. Sorry, oh, I misunderstood what sorry, I misunderstood what, what you said. I didn't catch the beginning. Uh um the old electronic organs that were yeah. quite popular for families of in the early eighties, often oh, with yeah. uh foot pedals and a couple of manuals. And some that, pretty pretty ropey so, uh patches. Yeah. But those keyboards I remember being comparatively easy to find because that's what I ended up using. Right. Okay. I'm not well, looking, I'm not looking for them anymore because those don't have any kind of cachet. They're you know no one wants to use them for synth music. They've got yeah pretty easy sounds, but as keyboards, I seem to remember them pretty much being thrown out. I think that was the problem, wasn't it? Everything was thrown out, and then now you can't find them anymore. I mean, if you could go back to like the late eighties and gather up a load of these old machines, now they'd be worth twelve grand each. I'll just go back and say, stop, don't throw them out. They'll be worth a fortune. Same with real to real. I'd pick up a Jupiter Ace while I was at it. Pick up a Jupiter Ace? Uh, Ace, the uh, fourth computer. Oh, sorry, Ace, yes, yeah. yeah. No, yeah I mean, it's it's exactly back, the same with those, isn't it? It's exactly the same with the with your ZX80s you, and your Acorn Atoms. Well, the ones I have is the uh, Jupiter Ace, which is proving too expensive. That and the other one I hold, you know, the other machine I want is the um, Fairlight, but because that's a Z80 as well inside there, I think. Fairlight, so yeah, I don't yeah. think it is Z80, I'm not too familiar with it. I know that if you found one nowadays, you'd be looking at 20 or 30 grand. They did, they did release a new Fairlight, but they cheated and bunged a PC in it instead and just wrote some software and it's all a PC. Yeah, that's what I'd do. But the, the original Fairlight with the like Pet Shop Boys used, they were very heavy users of the Fairlight. They used the emulator too as well. They were quite popular back in the uh, back in the 80s. It was kind of that decade, wasn't it, where you obviously your early analog synthesis, then that got boring. So it's like, well, what can we do? So Depeche Mode started smashing glass and bashing on bits of metal and recording it and then put it onto a keyboard and that's what they did. And then Pet Shop Boys sort of got that idea and started doing sample-based stuff. And that seemed to be like the later on in the 80s and then Wave Table with the PPG. It must have just been an amazing decade for the development of sound. I don't know what would be next. You can't, I can't think in my head what would be next. If you look back then, synthesizers were so popular because they were the new sound you'd never heard them before. Now, what what is that new sound that you've never heard? Everybody can get a laptop now and make some sound there must be something that's not doesn't exist yet that we need to think of do you think it's going to be the sound or the controller that becomes the next step in synthesis uh, I, I don't know i think there's going to be a massive resurgence on analog i think there's definitely going to be a big comeback with with analog 
And I think it's that sound, it's that analog sound that people still want. I think people still use reel to reel, and reel to reel is still quite still popular for studio and analog mastering and things, actual using analog tape. But I can't I can't think what the next the next I suppose if you if we were back in 1984, we wouldn't know what the next is, would we? We're just a, it's kind of the same thing. I, I do I do think it's going to be some somewhere down the lines of analog, mm. the analog sound coming back because when when sequential have re-released the Prophet, Prophet Five, it looks identical, and they've used the Curtis chips, the clones of the Curtis chips. They're actually using analog oscillators and analog filters. They're using a modern microcontroller, obviously, to control everything, but they're using the analog actual analog hardware. That's why it's so expensive. It's still about three grand to get. With the analog stuff. Well, I'm sure Bering are going to use the one that's going to be 1500. What's that? Sorry, the Behringer. But yeah, Behringer will bring out something that's cut price, won't they? That's just a mimic. Oh, yeah, but they're there. They, I don't like them. Is so, it because they do the cut price of the the nice yeah, it's, kit? It's cut price stuff, isn't it? And cut price cheap, and yeah, they're not. They're not the. They're not the top of the audio line, are they? They do. They do no, a lot. They do a lot. Yeah, the thing. They seem to do enough that everyone seems to still keep buying them. Yeah. I think it's just down to that. You like a per you like a particular brand, and I, and I think it's just down to that. I'm not a fan of Behringer, so I don't buy their stuff. I'm not. I'm not doing it because I think it's crap. I'm doing it because I just don't like. I'm not a fan of their brand. I just I think it's just one of those for me. It's not not I've not actually gone into buying anything and actually testing it out. I think it's just down to preference of brands that I like and brands that sound cool. And like, I like Profit. I like the name of the uh, synthesizers. Like the Jupiter is an amazing name for, for a keyboard. Absolutely brilliant name. Yeah. Just going back to um, Stephen's comment about will, it, will the future be the sound or will it be the controller? And that brought to mind someone like Imogen Heap to my mind. And she, it's more to do with the interaction and the composition rather than the sounds, because there's so many different varieties of synthesis techniques available now. Yeah. Um, and it's more the interplay between the musician and the sound. So she has this glove system where she's waving her hands and uh, clicking her fingers and manipulating the sound panning the sound so when she waves her hand across from left to right and right to left the sounds actually panning from speaker to speaker and just seeing that kind of a synth symphony of performer and sound it's quite um in terms of the creative musical intensity it's pre pretty awesome and if you think about uh syntax in the past like Crawford, they're always uh, slated being very wooden and uh just stood behind the in instrument and there was no drama. Yeah, so yeah. Now we've, so yeah, that, that's an area of uh, exploration. I just was thinking as well, maybe uh, with machine learning and AI, there'll be the interaction between the performer and the sound. So the, the AI reflecting back with the performer. Yeah, I think, I think yeah, it kind of goes to the, the laser harp, doesn't it? In the, in the 80s time or the 90s when they had the, they were going to the back of the stage with a laser harp. It's kind of that thing again. See, I, I, I find with technology that I don't see anything new. Things have enhanced. But you look at something like a telephone. A telephone is still a telephone, like it was when you first picked up a wooden box and wound, wound a handle. You're talking to somebody on the end of a, on a speaker. It's the same thing. They, they do a bit more now but it's still a telephone. It's like, what is new? A television is still a television. It's not a four inch CRT black and white. It's 50 inch plasma and 3D, but it's still a television. It's what is new in technology. A keyboard music is still there. That's what I'm trying to think. What is gonna be the next thing in technology? What is the latest? Everything's evolved and enhanced. It's like a car is still a car. Even, even if it's not one from the forties, it's still, You've got you driving around on four wheels. Might be more comfortable and a bit more fuel efficient and warmer, but you're still a car. It's not a new thing anymore. 
That's 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 the kind of thing I, the way I think about technology at the moment. What is absolutely brand new, never seen before? Yeah, but to, to take cars, if you look at some sort of the concepts, say self-driving cars, they're saying, well, okay, you know, if, if we don't need a driver, what can you do with the space? And so it, it's you've seen these interesting concepts where basically you have a um, the, the car is just a flat bed and you can put modules on and, and, and they can drive or you can say, well, it, it can be like your route. It can be like a hotel room that just moves around. <laughs> you, um, yeah, so uh, I think, yeah, things kind of get sort of remixed you know, in interesting, yeah. well, interesting ways. Though. I don't see the future of self-driving cars. I think it's a disaster waiting to happen. Oh, I think the control aspect is quite interesting because a phone, like a mobile phone, is actually now more like a computer, right? So it's just kind of a it's, well, yeah, it's, it's, a, a, it's a computer disguised as a phone, as a phone. Hence the the notion with the um, the, con the the control and how the musician interacts with the whole thing and what the, the performance is actually. That's an interesting aspect there. Yeah, it's, you're right. It's, it's down to the interaction, isn't it? Because nobody nobody likes phone calls anymore. Everybody uses text or yeah, chats. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Phone you you would tap the phone actually. The actual phone bit is is. Yeah, it's the user interaction and what else you can do, what else you can do with it. That, that's like, I think that's the future in the music, like you were saying. I think with, with um because people talk about now you've got a computer in your pocket, and yes, you have got a computer in your pocket. Um, but all that's happened is that computer moved, because at one point... It was on your when, desk. Well, at one point, you picked up the phone and the person plugged the the um the, the leads in so you could click to connect you up you could you could claim they were a kind of they were a human powered computer but then as soon as they brought in automatic switching which was like I, that essentially was a computer that um connected your phone call so yeah. what's actually happened is that the computer has moved to the handset yeah, there was a computer before and now it's just been distributed been moved. yeah good good way of thinking yeah because we see Back in the back in the seventies, eighties, when the Plessy and those people developing the system, B B T system for the modular switching. Well, even even before that, when they when they introduced when they introduced the first like um, automatic routing of um, phone calls, that was basically just an analog computer. Yeah, relays and switches. Yeah, but I, I guess the, I, 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 I'll take I'll, I'll be a um, contrarian. I, 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 I kind of object to that because yeah, yeah, the um, that was basically those were circuit switch networks. So you, you had a circuit that was connected, made A to B, whereas now it, it's all packet switched, right? So that the uh, there's not one computer anymore. It's a network, and your 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 voice call is it, it's digitized. It's just it's just packets on the network now, rather than what rather than a, a a circuit that you own while you you've got that. Uh, uh, you're talking to that, that person, so you're, you're still sharing your bandwidth. You're still mimicking circuits, though. I mean, if you look it's, at it's, the, it's mimicking, yeah. But I mean, under the hood, it's it's completely different. But it's it, all void. The system. system. I mean, they they still had um, even when it was circuit switch, they still had like multiplexes and things like that um, in places to actually um, save cost. So. Yeah, I mean, it, it's different. It's an evolution, but it's kind of um, the fact that computers are involved in routing phone calls isn't a new thing. It's kind of the point. Evolved, that yes, yeah. That, that's that's, that's why I'm trying to. That's why I think it. it's not new. It's evolved. It's like we, we've gone VoIP at work because BT decided they want to switch off the phone lines in a few years' time. But you still pick up a phone on your desk. Nobody at work has a clue that it's going over the internet and it's VoIP and it's not through an analog line. So it's, it's just evolved the technology of the way it's connecting. You still dial a number, you still ring somebody. It's just all done online. Done over the internet rather than over the air. Uh, but then we still need an analog phone line to get the internet. So it's never going to go, is it? Yeah. yeah. If you think about it, like phone numbers in general, nowadays you can type in someone's name on the computer, right? You don't really need numbers, but we still are stuck with the concept of numbers. So the same way we are stuck with, with old concepts which we like like synthesizers synthesizers like you know you're still emulating a a, a subtractive synthesizer right yeah you're still emulating the same system like circuits when you make a phone call you're still emulating the 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 same feeling with a, with a with an elevator right with a lift it's not that relays anymore 
but you still have the same sort of interface to users or like something similar. If you, if you, if you open an application on your phone, on your super iPhone, which is a synthesizer, or even just on a, on a digital workstation, audio workstation, they still look like physical synths. Yeah, they do, because everybody, nobody likes change, I think that's what it is. Yeah, absolutely. We like no. that, we like that uh, physical interaction with everything. I think well, like, maybe, maybe one of the new things that's coming out is jetpacks. <laughs> maybe. That'll be fun. Good, good. Don't have to get stuck in the snow. Sure, Elon Musk will come out with something like in the next couple of years. I mean, he's done cars and rockets and tunnel boring machines and flamethrowers. So <laughs> the pack is not too far away. <laughs> but I mean, there is a there is a guy that's trying to sell jetpacks, and he's desperately trying to sell them. He he did a a video, um, or he he got involved with um some mountain rescue. Um, I, don't, I can't remember where it is. It's somewhere in the UK, and basically, um, I think they're trying to trying to like drum up um, support so they could fund doing it. And they did a video where he flies up to the top of a, a mountain um, where some, I mean, it's staged, but where some like um, climber has, has has had an accident, um, and so he gets up there. Give him a quick once over and goes, Oh, yes, this person is. So he phones and gets the helicopter to come up. And you're like, So you've got a helicopter that's going to come up to it. Why don't you just send the helicopter? Yeah. Jetpacks such low range, shouldn't they? Yeah, then it's, yeah. Anyway, I think perhaps Jetpacks is going slightly off topic. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, it's not ever so slightly. Not retro. They are computer controlled. But, yeah. Maybe okay. we could do a retro. They are retro. <laughs> Control it with assembly language. Oh, well, if anyone know, wants to build us a very controlled, uh, or even a 68K controlled jetpack, I'm, I'm, I'm all up for giving it. <laughs> Speaking of assembly, did, did you go for assembly because just, just a challenge of it? Uh, I mean, mostly you can have SCC or something like that. C com compilers for these, these old chips. I, I just, I went with assembly because, yeah, auth authentic. I've never so used the compiler for Z80. I've got a basic compiler. That compiler software I use has a basic compiler, but I like assembly for Z80. It's nice. I hate pick assembly. I'm not... AVR assembly is okay, but I don't really use AVR. But I, I really like Z80. It's a nice language. It's quite... A, the commands are quite nice. It, it flows quite nicely. I, it's just a, a lovely language, is Z80 assembler. Again, like C, C is, but I just don't see the need when you can program something in that low level where you've got complete control over your chip. Mm. It's the next, it's next up from actually typing the hex yourself, isn't it? Hex assembler. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I, I, I had this, this notion from someone that that old computers were made for for assembly, so you can do assembly on on, on a six five zero two as a human, but like modern compilers, basically. I mean, modern assembly language is basically meant for compilers. So maybe an AVR is, is the last one that you can actually, you know, the most modern one that you can actually, you know, program yourself. But you wouldn't do that in a in a in a professional setting. Maybe a pick. But like an Intel computer, you wouldn't ever I think dream you of can typing use. it. You could, yeah. But do you want to? I mean, as you say, Z80 device drivers, etc. Yeah. You can use yeah. yeah if you wanted it. to go low level for certain applications, yes. But I think most people program would use something, some compiled. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally like C. If I'm doing anything on Linux, so I want to do, I'm experimenting with the embedded Linux on the little computers, and I use C or C plus plus. Java I find a little bit slower because it's interpreted. We're well, not interpreted as such, but it's run on the JVM. C yeah. is just quick compiles down to machine language. I I think for like, when I program PIC in the modern day, I use C, there's no point using assembler. You can use assembler in MP Lab X, but there's no point. C is just much better these days. It's compiled down anyway. But when you're doing something like the Z80, I don't, Z80 assembler is, is the way it was and the way it is. I think nowadays there's too much choice. Back then it was easier, it was assembler and that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think Z80s particularly. I, I did um, commercial um, Z80 
we see um, for, for about five or six years. And it works and it's great because it, the code's portable, but in terms of like, um, if it's if it's code that's got to actually do something quick on a Z80, you really want to be doing assembler. Um, but I'd say that kind of by the point, the cutoff for me would be around the 286, sort of like 68,020 like era. Um, at that point, it kind of started getting, because the, the faster CPUs can get, the more instructions they can run, which means you're probably actually going to get it to be doing more stuff. The code's going to, generally, the code's going to be bigger, so it's going to take you longer to develop it. Um, and at that point, you kind of, that trade-off between, well, you've got quite a bit of CPU power, you trade that off for the um, for the source code. But I think I I probably wouldn't do um, C on anything less than the 286, generally. Again, I think it depends what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I did um, I did uh, like um, RS two three two device drivers in C on a two eight six, and it was it it I did it in both. I did um, eighty eight six or eight two eight six assembler and um, C, and the the C actually ended up quicker and had less bugs. The yeah, I mean, at, that, at that stage, you, you are all fitting into into optimization, right? So, what are the the compiler? How can wrap its head around more kind of tricks that you can? Yeah, I mean, like O one, which is like optimization level one in GCC, you can actually put out some pretty good code. Like, it'll be maybe not too far off what you might write yourself. Um, you know, it's probably not going to, you know, in certain situations, it's not going to obviously just the most efficient code. Um, but I mean, people who write compilers are pretty smart people as well. And um, I'd love to understand how these things work to actually produce the assembly. But uh, yeah, um, compilers can be pretty, pretty clever and pretty smart. So. Yeah. Try to do just something simple, like you know, like a for loop, or, or maybe find the first hundred prime numbers or something like that, and let the the compiler do some optimization, even just like mid level, and then take the next week to figure out why it did what it did, why it takes what it did. It's a very interesting exercise, but maybe a bit masochistic. Well, especially as the C compiler um, GCC on. Um like modern um, ones, you can tell it like exactly what kind of CPU it, you've got and it, it will generate slightly different code. Yeah. Yeah, so I've, I've kind of got some first-hand experience with this because my current project is using a 68030. Um, and that's got some bit filled manipulation instructions, which you wouldn't have on uh, something like, you know, just a plain 68000. Um, so if you were to switch between 68,000 and 68030 as the CPU type, uh, you would see like some variations in how it was handling bit fields because on the 68,000 would be like some ands and ors and shifts and whatnot. But on the uh, 68030, you've got like a, a bit field instruction, which can, you just give it a couple of parameters like from this bit to this bit um, in this register. And it will then just basically take that little slice of it and chuck it in, you know, the least significant bits as of the destination. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's pretty cool to actually sort of see it, you know, in operation. I think it's just down to what you do in the application. Use what's best for the job. That's what I always say to myself. Yeah. I mean, I, I like the challenge for the job. So on a Z80, uh, I'd more than likely probably just end up writing assembly for it. But um, once you start getting into a more capable processor, you know, it sort of becomes a choice of like, well, assembly is cool and all that, but like, you know, <laughs> sometimes it's just easier to write C and uh, 
let the assembler or the compiler take yeah, care of. It, it, it depends on what you're doing, right? I mean, if, you, if you're, if you're, 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 it's your your page kind of solve a problem and in, in a time efficient way, and sometimes assembly makes sense, and sometimes yeah, you know, it, it's it's far, it, it's faster to code it in jar in, in Java or Python, and you know, execution time isn't 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 the thing you're, you're trying to maximize. You're trying to maximize how, how far you can get the code written. Yeah, I mean that's that is a good point. I mean, um, when when like microcomputers first came out, they were all um, running basic because that was at the time that was the way that um if you wanted to do like a one-off program where you were trying to calculate something you didn't have spreadsheets or anything like that to do math you'd write a basic program to do your like scientific calculations and it was even though the program might take a day to run whereas if it was written in assembler it might take an hour by being writing it in basic you might write it in a day, whereas if you, um, and then run it in a day, whereas if you wrote an assembler, it might take you a week and then you throw it away. So you've, yeah, it ran in an hour, but it took you an extra like five days to actually um, like write and debug the thing. And back in basic, it would tell you if you've made a mistake or as assembly, you're not gonna really know until you run it. Uh, you get something wrong and then the machines come crashing down because, uh, yeah, so I see it's nice well, trying to swing into the same location at the same time yeah. or something. <laughs> I, 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 I go by the belief of in the best best engineer uses what's right for the job. Doesn't get hung up on what they like, what's popular, what their fanboys are. It's what is right for the job. No, I mean, you're right. That's, that's half of the, the, the kind of knowledge and, and skills of an engineer find the right tools yeah if i was i was designing this synth today i would not use a z80 i've used a z80 obviously for authenticity and for my mm. own knowledge and the fact that that's the way i'm driving my youtube channel to be retro tech rather than modern tech but if i was doing a polysynth now i would probably use a pick i probably wouldn't run it at 16 megahertz i probably wouldn't see that it needed that quick I might clock it down a bit, just depends on what I was doing. I might use a couple of CPUs. I might use a few slave CPUs, depending on to make it easier to program. But I would probably, for this machine, I would probably use you know, PIC, 40 pin PIC, and that would do everything. It would have a multiplexed ADC, it would have the storage, it would have an EEPROM, it would do all the digital stuff. Maybe I'd need to have some expanders for ports, like shift registers for LED displays and whatnot. But I'd choose the chip that did everything in one one box, in one package. I wouldn't use an Arduino. Actually, I would because then then people would, would look at my channel because that's the first thing people people search for. <laughs> what was that? Hmm, sorry. Arduino. <laughs> Arduino. Yeah, I mean, you know, people basically identify uh, or equate embedded things with Arduino nowadays. So yeah. they wouldn't wouldn't search for pick. If you want a channel that, that people find, that you, you might just you know smash something in Arduino. It's just kind of get people hooked on it. Yeah, I, I get that. I, I get the Arduino stuff is is popular and it's is how I started. But I I, don't, I just personally I don't like it anymore. I don't I don't like the environment. I like to, I like the pick because you can dive into everything, read the data sheet, set everything up. I do it on a lot more technical perspective. I see people who stick a 16 megahertz Arduino Nano in something. You think you could just do that with an AND gate or a logic gate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, yeah, I think that's, that, that's overkill. 16 megahertz for that is doing nothing. Yeah. yeah, but you know what? Arduino is really, really popular because it makes these things accessible, right? So if you want to want to start off in this hobby, you would need a programmer, you would need a, yeah, of course, yeah. an IDE, yeah, course, you would yeah. need the chips, you would need to figure out which chips you want to use. I mean, there are more kinds of picks than, than the, I don't know, bugs in the world, right? Oh, it's a minefield of picks. It's, so it's a minefield. Like, you, to, find, to find the right one is like, you know, you need to be an engineer for that, you know, who has experience with picks. And with the Arduino, someone made those, those choices for you. So you, 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 you go for it and you get the, the board, the, the whole... Um, Clock system basically, uh, the IDE, it can be programmed on USB, so you don't need any programming. Any, yeah, any, anybody has like a for that, yeah. 
absolutely. So, yeah. so to get hooked, get hooked on your thing, it, it's brilliant. Has, the, has the, anyone the, here used a Pi Pico yet? No, I, I, I wanted to buy one, but it was like, you know, as soon as I read the article, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to buy one. And it was like out of stock. So I'm like, okay, well. <laughs> Driving tomorrow. They have them on the Pi Hut. Okay. That's cool. You can only uh, buy one. Yeah, yeah. Usually. That, that, that's usual. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty interested in, in Python. So I was, I'm a kind of interested in, in, in seeing how people, I mean, Python is a high level thing, right? I would never dreamt in a million years to, to, to actually use this on such a such an embedded thing. So MicroPython is kind of kind of an interesting either best of both worlds or worst of both, both worlds. It might be interesting I to see. I think the, the BBC Microbit also uses MicroPython if I remember right. So if you want to use MicroPython to get help from Microbit as well. Mm -hmm. Not a fan of the language, sorry to say. Don't like Python. Oh, it's so comfy though. So the clean. Embedded, embedded language. I don't like the indented. So like Parallax Propeller is a fantastic chip. So powerful, but I hate the language. And if I don't like the language, I'm not, I won't get into it. But with, with C and Java and well, any of the C syntax, it's all pretty much the same syntax, give or take a few differences in the languages, but Java to C, C++, it's all very similar. You can switch between one or the other fairly quickly with the knowledge, but I can't get into Python. Not not something I've I've ever really done. I suppose that my my thing is it is more embedded systems, it's more microcontrollers, it's more C. That that's my kind of thing. I'm not into I've used BeagleBone, BeagleBoard, got an embedded Linux board, haven't really done anything with it yet. I can't really think of anything to do with it. I need to think of a project with that, but I'll probably end up using C.